May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I asked Nancy to pause in the reading of the gospel between um, what I think, what scholars have said, some scholars, the scholars that are right, <laughs> um, about an authentic, or at least the echoes of an authentic parable theme by Jesus, and the echoes of the early Christian church, namely Matthew's community. And the place, if you want to see what I'm, I'm thinking about, is at the end of, of the first part of the reading. So they seized him, the son that is, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Pause. Now, just come and think with me on this. I think following, now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will put those wretches to a miserable, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to posit for you in the marinating pot that that's not Jesus. That's part of the a rhetorical uh, violence language that we find in Matthew's gospel. And it's been misinterpreted for generations, particularly because it's been interpreted that this is an anti-Jewish saying, along with others in Matthew's gospel. But that's a misreading of this gospel lesson altogether. What does the end of this little reading say? It was the chief priests and the Pharisees who perceived that he was talking about them. Well, who are they? They are the religious authorities. They're the people that walk around in stuff like this. It was not about the Jewish people. That's another tributary we could go down about how we have used this kind of language for the darkest and most terrible activity known to humanity. And maybe that's, that's a tributary of what I think this gospel is about, and that's why I've asked you to think with me about this. You know chapter 21 in Matthew's gospel, right? You've all memorized it. And you know that the opening story in chapter 21 of Matthew's gospel is what? <laughs> By the way, aren't you glad Jeopardy's back? I was bereft. Chapter 21 is what? I'm sorry. Uh, the tenants and the wine. The tenants and the wine. Is that chapter 21 beginning? Okay, I'm going to correct you. Go ahead. You ready? Yeah. Palm Sunday. It's the triumphal entry. It was the comic street theater that Jesus is coming in on uh, one side of Jerusalem on a donkey and her colt, a nursing colt. And Pontius Pilate's coming in on the other on a white horse with guards and spears and chariots. And Jesus is coming in on a donkey. It's street theater. It's a poke in the eye. You think you're so good. 
What follows that in Matthew's gospel? All right, that's correct. I know you're all thinking it. The cleansing of the temple. Do these things begin to maybe create a theme in chapter 21 a little bit? And then Jesus curses the fig tree because it does not bear fruit. Well, you know what the fig tree is, don't you? I think so. The organized folks that are supposed to be bearing fruit. Cut it down, he says. And then it gets really good. He's teaching in the temple now. He's back. He says that tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom before these fancy dudes in there. Now, I don't know about you. <laughs> Being, suggesting, suggesting that prostitutes are better than me? Well, that's offensive. Set it right to their face in the temple. And then we have this gospel. The parable, oh, the parable of the two sons is in there too. Yes, I go, but he doesn't go. But those who didn't think they were worthy of going, they are the ones that do go. Okay, you get my point. Is it any wonder they crucified Jesus? Really? I mean, stop and think about it. The point, I think, of chapter 21 is the courage to speak truth to power, no matter what. The courage to speak truth to power because within and beneath you, there is a greater power. I was thinking, because I was going to see you this Sunday, and I was trying to think of a connection with this speaking truth to power, and I, I, the thought occurred to me to ask you to, to marinate in this this week or whenever you want to, or don't at all. If you had to give an elevator speech as to why you're sitting here as a Christian, what would that elevator speech be? I think mine might be the word became flesh and dwelled among us. That's it. You see, speaking truth to power is something Jesus did in the flesh. And I think it teaches us that we can use our flesh in the same way. We can speak truth to power. Paul says, I want to be like Jesus, to know Jesus, and in essence, to act like he did so that I may come to more fully know him and his suffering, said Paul. This is a tough Jesus. This is a Jesus who is not, who is not um, comfortable with the status quo. This is a Jesus who uses his flesh, his courage, his wisdom, his love, to speak for those who have no voice. Why do you think, leading up to chapter 21, the stories of Jesus healing the lame and the blind and lifting up the poor, why do you think that was so offensive to the people that walk around in this stuff? It, 
why have they allowed those people to suffer as they have? Well, exactly. Well, part of the reason is that the poor and the disenfranchised don't have the shekels to make the proper sacrifices to guys like me. And I then open the book to page 385 and say the thingy over them. Well, not like me, of course. But you know what I mean? They couldn't afford the temple institutional um, ritual. And Jesus said, you don't need to do that. He gathers everybody around and lays hands or lifts up or invokes God's spirit and people are made new again. Don't you think that would make the people that, you know, who the heck does he think he is? Speaking truth to power, not just by word, but the word made flesh in his actions. That's what I think this gospel is about. The rhetorical violence in the second part of this story I think it's Matthew's community making an allegory. And I would like to suggest to you that you, you think very carefully before you think Jesus ever said, miserable wretches. So let me go to an example of what I'm, I'm thinking about. It comes from, I think, last week. Her name is Nanji's Mohammadi. She is an Iranian woman, an activist, who is in prison and was just awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for her actions speaking for women who are suffering in Iran. She's in prison. She probably may stay there perhaps for the rest of her life, and yet she continues to speak even from prison. She's speaking truth to power. She is the word made flesh who is dwelling among us. And that comes from a long line of people who were brave, who used their flesh to speak truth to power. St. Paul is one of them. Nelson Mandela, Dr. King, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Rosa Parks, our own Jonathan Daniels. You could make a list of your own, of people who use their flesh to speak truth to power. And so the question for this confront of gospel, it seems to me for us, is what do we do with it? How do we use our flesh to speak truth to Power that oppresses, power that pushes aside, power that negates, power that belittles. That's the challenge that this gospel gives us. And we're coming to this table, the Lord's table, to be fed, to be strengthened, to find our voice. The flesh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word is in you, in your flesh, and it dwells among us. Amen.